some time ago, I made a video about the Mario ROM hack called Coronation Day, and I started the video by kind of dunking on a lot of mainstream horror games, which made me look kind of pompous and full of myself in retrospect. What I meant to say is that a lot more of the popular horror franchises out there just don't appeal to me personally. I'm just not engaged with their core mechanics, and the spooks tend to fall a bit flat for me. It's more of a matter of preference for me rather than measuring objective quality. In most cases, at least. There are horror games I enjoy a lot. Some I might even cover on the channel at some point. But they're far and few in between. If the layers of fear and Five Nights at Freddy's of the medium don't quite grip me, then what does? For me, where most of my horror attention goes to are quaint little genre called RPG Maker Horror Games. Just hearing the words RPG Maker undoubtedly paints a picture in most people's heads, but for the few who are uninitiated, RPG Maker is a long-running line of software application that allows literally anybody to use to make their own role-playing games. However, the role-playing aspect can just as easily be ignored, and the engine used to make whatever game the creator feels like in whatever coding language applicable. These horror games have existed for a while, but really blew up around the late 2000s and early 2010s for Western audiences, but have a far more storied history in their native country of Japan. As a blanket statement, the basic objective of most of these horror games is simply to walk around, interact with the map, maybe do some puzzle solving, and make it to the end. Obviously, mileage will vary depending on the game, and not every game perfectly matches that description, but it's a fairly accurate way to describe everything quickly. That description sounds pretty weak and uninviting, but the devil's in the details, because it's misleading for two reasons. The first being that I've lost all confidence myself to deliver a competent script and have probably made my fool out of myself for trying. And the second being that since anyone can use this program, you get to experience some of the most out there, off the chain, unique experiences in the history of the medium of video games. Think about it. These games often come from extremely small teams, if not one person entirely and they're unrestrained by advertisers or any outside influences to create something wholly their own. These games are what I consider to be uncut gems, which aren't easy to sell to someone, but hold their value in raw passion. They feel much more personal and intimate to play rather than a storied franchise. That's at least how I rationalize my enjoyment of the genre emotionally also helps a huge batch of these games are completely free or dirt cheap. But you know what's even scarier than any RPG Maker game? Having your information or identity stolen, which is alarmingly common in today's digital age. This is why I've partnered with today's sponsorship, Aura. The odds of falling victim to online crime are 1 in 4, which is why Aura is offering all-in-one protection for you and your family, which includes a password manager, its own virtual private network service, or VPN, 24-hour customer support, antivirus services, and the ability to have your data removed from the collection of data brokers who want to sell your information at the highest bidder. Through Aura, you'll notice just how much brokers take of your private information, which you can prevent and have taken down through their services. Aura offers both a mobile phone application as well as a website that can be synced together so you can always stay aware of personal information has been compromised and tracking all the analytics you'd need to feel safe and secured browsing the internet. Your identity and data should remain private, and that's why Aura is offering a 14-day free trial for this all-in-one protection with the code Aura.com slash HeyPeter. You can cancel any time and get up to 63% off in the future. That's Aura.com slash HeyPeter. Link in the description. Online privacy is something I feel quite strongly about, so I'm overjoyed that Aura reached out to me. Huge thanks for sponsoring this video. Back to your scheduled programming. Without a doubt, the most famous example of this genre is Yume Nikki, which has been the subject of countless video essays, my own included, which you should watch. The isolation and deeply intrapersonal relationship people felt playing this piece of freeware was honestly yet to be matched for me, 
and part of the reason it had such an effect on me because it was a passion project of a solo, anonymous developer made for his or her own purposes. After I played Yume Nikki, I planned to go on a deep dive into the game and discover if I could find something that matched, if not surpassed, how Yume Nikki made me feel. To do this, I wanted to ask my subscribers what they felt was the most influential RPG maker horror game, so I could find a game that was made early in the genre's life and sort of branch off from there. The answers I got were interesting, to say the least. Also, thank you for all the answers. I feel really blessed that I have such a small fan base that's always suggesting new things to me. The third most common answer was Amori, which is surprising given how recently it came out by comparison. I haven't played this one yet, and I've heard it's a huge game with a lot of details to comb over, so I'll give it some time before I sink my teeth into it. I did pick up a physical copy for Switch some time again, though. The runner-up from first place is the Corpse Party franchise, which could easily take the crown of being the exemplar RPG Maker horror series. I remember it blew up on Let's Play YouTube a decade ago. Corpse Party looks like a huge franchise with multiple different installments, remakes, ports, and whatever else, so I'm definitely going to keep my eye on the franchise for now. You can watch Thaf 9s video on the series in the meantime, it's probably better than anything I could make. But the number one series people kept listing was Ao Oni, and I had definitely heard that name before. <laughs> It was pretty popular 10 years ago, but I thought it was just one game. When I did some research, I fell down a deep, dark, owl rabbit hole that stretched so far beyond the scope of what I expected. There's several different versions of the same game, all with wildly different stories and locations, several sequels, fan games, a manga series, a television show, several movies, and even an MMO game developed by um... It is positively mental how large a reach a piece of freeware can have, even outside of Japan. Imagine a short free game you made when you were 20 years old suddenly becoming a multimedia franchise out of nowhere and you'd never have to leave your house again or ever make money. That's the dream. All of this stemmed from a piece of freeware released in the 2000s by a single developer. I think we have our answer for the most influential RPG maker horror game. That isn't Yume Nikki at least. My aim with this video is to cover the Ao Oni video games, or at least most of them, and conclude why I feel like Ao Oni had such a huge impact on people and the genre itself. A follow-up video will eventually come out detailing my similar thoughts on the various adaptations Ao Oni has had throughout the years, including a novel series and several films. No idea when that will come out though. Buckle in, because we're about to go on a wild ride. You know it's even wild. Hey, Ao Oni here. Hope you guys sub to the channel. Also make sure to give Hey Peter's Patreon a visit, because he just uploaded a video where he gives director's commentary in all his videos, and has been reviewing the Sonic series in his car like the freak he is. I'm, I'm only telling you this because he's got two different tiers you can subscribe to, one of which gets your name at the end of his videos, but, you know, if you don't, I, I might have to leave a bag of dog turds in your front step. Sorry, it's just how it's, how it's gonna be, man. I, I, I can't help it, man. Let's start with the real basics. Also, ignore whatever the Oni said before. He always tells one truth and one lie. What we call Ao Oni is a freeware horror game developed on RPG Maker 2003 or XP, it's one of those two. Much like Yume Nikki, making it something of a sister game to Kikiyama's magnum opus. Many RPG Maker creators tend to have disconnected lives out of their game development and our Oni creator No Props is no different. Information about him is sparse outside of the land of the rising sun, so forgive me if I've missed anything. He has a semi-active online presence, so he isn't nearly as reclusive as Kikiyama, 
that's something I greatly admire about this genre, that you can create something that spans multiple games and be a colossal influence to thousands, and never show your face. According to the findings of the Aoni Wiki, which I will be using as my primary source for most of my info, no Props was an avid developer of RPG Maker throughout the 2000s, even originally developing the first version of the game sometimes in 2004. He's released several games around the late 2000s, but his standout release of Aoni, literally translating to Blue Demon in 2008, would completely change his career. Despite only being officially released in Japan, it eventually became such a massive, absurdly gargantuan hit that quickly developed a dedicated fanbase, which led to more versions of the game being developed, as well as more translations being added later on. The version of Aoni we're likely familiar with, the one you're picturing, the one PewDiePie and Markiplier played, is the 6.23 version that came out in November of 2011, because to my knowledge, it's the only version of the game with an official English translation. Each version is different in its own unique way, so I plan on playing most of them. But how do we go about that? Firstly, we need to follow the installation guide available on the wiki. Given that this game was made on fairly antiquated software, comparatively speaking, it's not going to work flawlessly on modern machines, so we need to adapt. Skip to this timestamp here if you just want to see the game. The installation guide goes as follows. Choose your preferred version from the wiki and install it. You will need the runtime package from RPG Maker XP, which can easily be freely downloaded from their official website. You might also need to change your computer's locale to Japanese. Only maybe though, don't restart the machine unless you want to try and navigate your computer in Japanese. I'm not quite at the stage of understanding and learning Japanese to play video games, so I will not be doing this. Best case scenario, you install the runtime package and then the game simply runs. Worst case, you're scouting forums on how to run this game. The wiki should have everything you need, just go through each section when you get more roadblocks. Heading back to the chart, you may notice that the first publicly available released version of this game, released in October of 2008, is officially not available in English. That's because the impeccable work of a fan translation group called Memories of Fear. They're mostly famous for translating Corpse Party, but they're also quite into a translating obscure RPG Maker games that have yet to get a full localization. They've since retired, but I owe a huge thanks to everyone who worked so hard to make these games playable in my mother tongue. Their translation did fix a few things, like slightly faster text scrolling and attempting to fix up some of the numerous, numerously absurd bugs this release has. Keyword being attempt. I'll talk more about this later. Keep in mind this won't be a perfect play-by-play -play walkthrough in all the games, so I'll be omitting some locations of keys or items for brevity. There are plenty of walkthroughs out there that will document that for you. Let's boot this baby up and see what all the hype is about. Oh wow, look at that stunning, silent title screen. The game begins with some exposition about rumors of a monster existing inside an old mansion at the edge of town. You play as middle schooler Hiroshi, chatting with his best friend Kazuya, when they're accosted by a bully named Takuro and his posse, which includes Megami, who will be somewhat important later in the series. Kuro harasses you and your friend into coming inside the abandoned mansion. The sound of something shattering gets Hiroshi to investigate further into the house, which finally lets you control the game. Also heads up, press Alt and Enter to fully screen older RPG Maker games. First and foremost, save right now, and save often. It is incredibly easy to die very, very quickly in 1.1 and lose a lot of progress. So anytime you gain a new item or progress further, save the game. Something you'll notice is that there is a ton of leftover RPG Maker stuff in this game that never comes up. Skills, stats that don't matter, a whole equipment section, you only ever use the item part of this game, so I'm not sure why no props left all this in. Something you will also notice is that the whole mansion basically looks the same. All the flooring is the same. The doors are copy-pasted, which makes everything blend in together, and basically nothing stands out. It's a small mansion that takes maybe two to three minutes to explore, although once the locked doors are opened, but those locked doors get gradually opened over time. 
meaning that for a huge majority of the game, you're walking around a mansion with no clue where to go, inspecting locked doors that all look exactly the same. You gradually gain keys as you progress. Some are found on tables, or corpses, while others require the power of observation gifted from the Lord. Not once will there be a clue or hint or any reasonable suspicion that a table or object can be pushed aside to reveal something that is absolutely critical and compulsory to beating the game. This is all to say that, without a guide, you will be spending the entire time looking around the same drab, boring house, praying you can find a door that looks exactly the same as every other door that happened to have a key you can use. With all this in mind, how does the game actually play? When you take control of Hiroshi, you'll find that the strange noise you heard was just a plate. But when we get a scene of something attacking the remaining group, I really like this section. We're getting a thermal vision view of whatever monster inside attacking a bunch of school children, and it looks really well done for RPG Maker XP. We return to the mansion to find the group has scattered, and that we mysteriously are unable to leave the mansion. We have two objectives. One, find Kazuya, and two, escape. We have to scour over the featureless, bland mansion until we reach a room that has one of the bullies, Takeshi, cowering in a cabinet, unable to be reasoned with. Curiously, if we try and spot him after any other story or event, he will mysteriously be gone. Head to the first floor and find the bathroom, and make the wild assumption that you can drain the bathtub, which leads you to finding the first corpse of one of the bullies, who conveniently has the library key on him. Loot his corpse and find the library. Where is the library? The only way to find out is by reading the key's description in the menu, because you can't tell what anything is by looking at it. Everything is just unlabeled sprites. Surely we could get some more unique doors, or just label some of the rooms instead of making someone waste their time checking every single door until one of them works? Inside the library is... There he is! The one. The only. True Blue. Awoni. So, let's address the elephant in the room. Firstly, he's purple, not blue. What the hell? Secondly, it's kind of insane that after we got a nice build-up to him at the start, and now he's just casually roaming the area like it ain't no thing. Thirdly, just look at him. What can you say about the Oni that hasn't already been said already? He's Yandere Dev, he looks like the monster made from Lean, he looks like Playboy Cardi, etc. He looks like the opposite of scary, he looks silly, goofy even. but. I think this works to the game's favor. Think about it, if he was just a generic scary monster, would the game have blown up as much as it did? Perhaps because he looks like a Wojak is partially why people began to take notice of this little freeware title. According to an interview conducted for the official Aoni guidebook, which is more of a series compendium, states that no props actually illustrated the Oni's head rather than manipulating a stock photo. It makes me see the Oni in a whole new light, because he looks like he's somewhere on a 6 out of a 10 skill for the Uncanny Valley, which is made more impressive that no props was able to make such a remarkable drawing for a game full of RPG Maker assets. That's how I see it anyways. Future Peter here, when I was editing I found a claim on Reddit of all places that according to no props on a Nico Nico video, which I don't think is cited, the face is actually an edited picture of Junji Takeda, a Japanese actor who was in a lot of movies I've never seen, except for Ice Age Meltdown, I did see that one. I have a very- I have like no evidence to support or back up this claim other than I saw a Reddit comment, but I thought it was interesting. Once we take this bedroom key, we enter the main gameplay of Aoni. Avoiding the Aoni. Every iteration of this game has both scripted and random chase sequences, where you have to avoid the Oni at all costs or get a game over. On paper, this works fine. In practice, it's a broken, buggy, unsatisfying mess. The gist of it is that the Oni tracks your movements and is slightly slower than you are, meaning you should be able to dodge and weave around it while it chases you throughout the entire mansion. I honestly don't know if there's supposed to be a timer or other method to make the Oni go away and stop chasing you so you can play the game, 
but I will tell you how to avoid the Oni 100% of the time, every time. Whenever he chases you, at any point in the game, just go to the library, get him on the left side of the wall while you're on the right, leave the room, and he despawns. It makes the various scripted encounters a lot less tense knowing that this is the easiest and most commonly available way to dispose of the Oni, while unscripted random chases where the Oni just shows up out of nowhere and blindsiding you, instantly killing you. Yes, damage numbers do sometimes show up when he gets you. He can also sometimes go through walls without warning. Did I mention 1.1 is buggy? Take note of the chase music. It's an incredibly basic loop, but it sounds tense enough to get your ass in motion and is basically the default theme for the franchise. I don't find it personally that scary, but apparently everyone else who played this game forever ago did, because it's just about in every single promotional thing Aoni related. Megami has locked herself inside of the bedroom and refuses to leave, so we just leave her there and continue exploring. I really hoped you liked clicking on everything, because you just have to click on this table here to get the second floor to get the attic key, which leads you to a room where you get another key and a flashlight. An incredibly janky item you have to manually select on highly specific spots to get other items. Which begs the question why it even exists if it's just going to roadblock an item you could have just gotten like the rest. The flashlight is used in maybe three spots in the entire game. Flash forward to the room where the cage we need to enter. There's a really great moment of surprisingly fluid animation of the Oni grabbing onto the cell you're in and trying to get inside, but failing. It looks really smooth and well done, and I would honestly say this specific part holds up pretty well after almost 20 years. Unfortunately, the rest of the game feels nothing like this. Why does he have a detailed ass? He this, fat ass. <laughs> this specific moment is on nearly every thumbnail for the game back in the day, so I think it's fair to say that this is the most iconic and spooky moment the game has to offer. After many other rooms and keys, you meet up back with Takuro, who fills you in on the situation and gives you the bedroom key so he can go see Megami. The second you leave the room, and I mean the instant, Takuro dies at the hands of the Oni, who just walks away. Dude had the key for one second, and died. At least we can loot the key back from his corpse. Megami has no new dialogue, which I feel is a huge missed opportunity. Why have this character around for the whole game if she isn't gonna say anything new? We got a basement key, somewhere. So we find a room with a photograph of an identified family. And a shovel, an item that works similarly to the flashlight and is used even less. We have to quickly hide inside the cabin unless we... Uh... What does the Oni even do to us? Does, does he eat us? Does he kill us? We find an underground tunnel that leads to a rope along the wall that should be our escape. Nobly, Hiroshi decides not to save himself right away until he finds Kazuya and Megumi, which means we have to go all the way back to the bedroom, eat her, and then go back to the tunnel, all while avoiding the Oni. I find it a little bit weird the party members don't follow behind you in this game. Kind of looks like every other character just gets absorbed into Hiroshi. Suddenly, we wake up as Kazuya, who apparently just slept through everything in another bathroom. If that wasn't weird enough, he just walks out of the door scot-free. What? I thought it was like magically locked or something. Why can Kazuya just leave? No time for that, because it's back to Hiroshi. We run down the tunnel, but uh-oh. The Oni beat us and ate the rope. Now what? Switch back to Kazuya, who finds another rope at a nearby cabin and lays it down a well. Not because he heard or saw his friends, but because that's just what you need to do to beat the game. It's very abrupt, but I really like the switching characters part of the game. It really helps sell the idea of Hiroshi and Kazuya being friends and exploring different parts of the mansion together, even if it feels a bit haphazard. You, yet again, have to head down the tunnel as Hiroshi, and climb the rope to finally beat the game. If that sounded sudden, it's because it was. Aoni 1.1 just flatly ends right there with some text explaining that the three survivors got away, 
and that Hiroshi still has the photograph of the family with him, which implies nothing and leads to nothing. It's very dull that something that seems like foreshadowing or reveal ends up being literally nothing. Like, no props forgot to include something later on and just never did it, then accidentally released the game. All in all, 1.1 doesn't give me a hugely positive impression. If you know what you're doing, you can be done with this game in less than half an hour. Despite clocking in at such a short time, despite clocking in at such a short time, the game felt way too long, because once you get the hang of the Oni chasing mechanics, the game follows a really simple and drab system of just finding the next item and outrunning the Oni. The chases are scary for the second and third time, but it's not like Outlast where it's dramatically different locations. You just have to use the arrow keys to walk around him, which kind of ruins the scare factor. There aren't a lot of absurd lows, but not a lot of highs either. It just kind of feels like an unfinished RPG Maker game made by an amateur. Which is fine, everyone starts somewhere, and I think even the most mediocre of RPG Maker games still have their charm and worth to them, but 1.1 manages to fall a little bit short of that again because of how old it is, requiring so much setup and workaround to play something not very entertaining. I'm sorry to all the 1.1 purists out there, but this game is kind of just mediocre, and I'm not interested in playing it again. It's kind of hard to find sources on how thus this particular version blew up, but I think it had the least fanfare. It still occupied similar spaces as Yume Nikki, but with receiving several updates and being released around the same time. And speaking of updates... Three point oh released on March two thousand nine, less than a full year after its older Oni brother. I can only assume that No Props had a fresh pair of eyes after the initial release and decided to tweak the game more. Once again, only released in Japanese, which is all the case but for one. But this time, I'm playing Ad Pro's translations. Someone who has translated just about every version of Ao Oni whom I will be relying on for this version, as well as 5.2. I'll be honest, I really dislike 3.0. Really, passionately detest 3.0. It's not fun. But how can that be? You'd think no props can only go up and improve from the last time. Well, I'll take it through you slow. We open on some familiar exposition about a mansion near the woods. This old guy is inside the infamous mansion and is unable to get out, and the Oni gets him. Who this is, is never explained. This time around, our cast has changed. Hiroshi, Takeshi, Takuro, and Megumi, now renamed Mika, are seemingly friends now. Also, Kazuya has been seemingly erased from existence. Rest in peace, sweet prince. They talk about the rumors of the monster living inside, which Hiroshi, now sporting a substantial glow up, saying is total nonsense and investigates the sound of glass breaking. What I want to highlight are the insanely mismatched character portraits everyone has. This was not done stylistically, I think, but because no props just found random pictures on the internet and plugged them into the game. This is why Hiroshi looks like Uryu from Bleach's dad, and why Takeshi looks like a WikiHow's character. I'm kind of undecided if I find the portraits unbelievingly charming or lazy. I think all the best games are regarded as both simultaneously, though. The basic setup is the same. Find your friends, then find a way out. You'll notice when you start playing that the mansion layout is quite different from last time around. There's a couple all-new rooms for you to enjoy, and other rooms have been cycled around the house to spice things up. Don't get up from your seats now, because it still runs into the exact same problem of everything in the house looking exactly the same, which I think I enjoyed even less than 1.1. 3.0 has a problem. A big, pulsating, purple problem. And it's the incredible bulk over here. Remember how the Oni was remarkably stupid in 1.1 and would get stuck on everything and almost never catch you? To compensate for this, 3.0's Oni is much smarter, able to cut you off and weave around objects with ease. 
However, I felt that this was greatly overcorrected, because instead of being too easy, it's often far too challenging and tedious to simply escape the Oni. The library technique doesn't work anymore because the room has changed so much just to avoid it. So how do you escape the Oni? The intended method is to outpace him and keep going in and out of rooms until he stops chasing you, which feels kind of nebulous in which he vanishes. Or you could hide in these cabinets scattered around the mansion. The cabinets, however, are a double-edged sword. On one hand, the lack of graphics while inside and hiding, only being able to use your ears to tell if the Oni is there, is brilliant, but is incredibly finicky. The Oni cannot be in the room when you try and hide. I really like this game over. It gives you no time to breathe, and is honestly a very effective scare. This is where the positives I have with the game end. Sometimes, when the Oni is supposed to exit the room, he just doesn't and gets to kill you instantly if you try and hide again. If you like the cabinets, you have to run across the entire map just to find one of them, which means dodging the much harder to grapple with Oni, who will instantly kill you if you come even a hair too close. 1.1 had a lot of emphasis on keys and trying to find them, while 3.0 dramatically increases the Oni chase sequences, which ends up being this game's downfall. Exploration wasn't super riveting to begin with, but being frustrated with an irritating and drawn out chase sequence legitimately every five minutes or less grinds the pacing to a squealing halt. 3.0 only lasts around 35 minutes, and I can vividly recall that half of that time was just sharking around the map because the Oni was after me. There are way too many chase sequences, and you have to go through all of that just to be led to an empty room you have to spend several minutes in to see if it has a key or not. Hey man, it's not my fault you can't dodge me. Sounds like you should just save Skyrim in five seconds and just hope for the best. Shut up, that's not fun. However, there's more to discuss. There's actually two whole puzzles in the game. Neither of them are very fun. The first involves you inputting a code into a safe by finding two sets of numbers while the other, at the very end, is just one of those puzzles you can brute force by making all the spots the right color to open the door. They're basic, but the first puzzle at least encourages exploration and looking for secrets, while the other serves little purpose other than just waste your time. Despite having more friends, alleged friends that is, he doesn't react much to seeing them killed one by one, or even have much dialogue with them. The script was far more riveting in 1.1, because I at least was a little bit invested in Hiroshi and Kazuya's friendship. These clowns in 3.0 feel like total fodder. I will say I laughed hard at Takeshi saying Mika will die first because she's weak, then the Oni casually decapitates Takuro. Also, I refuse to believe they are middle schoolers. No child looks like this. Okay, that was a bit harsh to say there's nothing going on in the game character-wise. Hiroshi gets one or two moments of character development. When you find the rope in the underground tunnel, like in the previous version, you're actually given the choice to either go back and find Takeshi and Mika, or escape yourself. Here's what happens if you choose to be selfish. Did you catch it? When we retrieve the other two, the Oni eats the rope like last time, and Takeshi bites the dust, while Mika runs somewhere else in panic. Exhausted from everything, Hiroshi decides to take a nap. Why he had so much confidence to sleep in a random bed while actively being pursued by Yandere Dev is beyond me. He is shortly confronted by the Oni, who can apparently speak, but is just Naoki in disguise. Who, who is Naoki? <laughs> who is this guy? <laughs> also, apparently it's his birthday, and everyone comes back to life just for him. Just kidding, he was dreaming the whole time. I guess Hiroshi wasn't as stone cold as I thought he was, and indeed felt sad that his friends died. Probably because he's 11. <laughs> oh, I didn't show how Mika died yet, did I? She gets stomped by this lovely fella, our second Oni. His name is Squanto, and he's hilarious. <laughs> He's so much bigger than the original Oni, which makes the chase he gives kind of intimidating by comparison. 
because he takes up so much space that you can barely tell if he's going to catch you or not. Once we solve the final puzzle, the upper floors of the mansion become strange and wavy, and we find the best room in the entire franchise. The Oni Room. A whole caged off section of freakish purple creatures of all sorts of shapes and sizes just sitting there, floating, making vague eye contact with you. Who locked them in here? What's actually going on inside this house? We have to let this sludgy eyeball oni slowly slither towards us so we can grab the key to the front door, and finally escape the mansion through the front door, with all of our friends dead. Before we make it, the original oni, who hasn't been locked up, has some words for us. What is he saying? Once we unlock the front door and run inside, the game is finished. I've already described most of the problems I have with this version, but there's a pervading curiosity is that Aoni actually raises some potentially interesting ideas and then just does nothing with them. Not in the sense that it's left ambiguous per se, it's that just the beginning stages of an idea are there with no leads and nothing is done with it making me question why it's even here. Who was the old man at the start? What's the deal with the Onis? Why are most of them locked up in a room? What was in the photograph in 1.1? Given how short the game is, you certainly don't need to explain everything. You can get away with not giving the Oni extensive lore, but it feels weird that it's like the beginning stages of an idea that was instantly dropped once included. Overall, 3.0 has some marginal improvements over 1.1, but its flaws made me unable to enjoy it as much as 1.1. The first edition was just a bit dull with having to explore every inch of the house, while 3.0 felt frustrating to play because you still had a little bit of blind luck in guessing where objects are, but also be harassed by the Oni every couple seconds. We're only halfway through the available releases, so don't go anywhere. Things go up from here. You'll notice that I skipped versions 4.2. That's because 4.2 and 6.03 for that matter are actually demo versions meant to tease the upcoming games. Just so you can get earlier access to running around the slightly redone mansion for the fifth or sixth time. 5.2 has been provided by the efforts of AdPro once again in English. So let's hop into it. 5.2 was released in October of 2009 making it the second version to be released within a year of 1.1 coming out. I can only imagine no props opening up RPG Maker again, again, and modifying the original project once more. It's a bit strange he keeps making little changes to the same project, because he's made other games that aren't Ao Oni that I should probably play at some point. 5.2 is kind of strange to talk about, because I feel like it's what 3.0 should have been. On the surface, it looks about the same, but with the opening cutscene of the old man being removed and the same four characters entering the mansion. Something you'll notice is that the mansion's design has been drastically scaled back. All the hallways are drastically shorter, along with room locations once again being switched around. This addresses a huge complaint I've had with the past two versions of the mansion being unremarkable and not very fun to navigate. You only have to remember the rooms because the hallways are so short, which makes searching for items a lot more tolerable. The mansion itself got quite the facelift too. Some sections of the house actually have different colored floorboards. And there's new assets. Oh god, I'm happy. I can tell rooms apart now. There's a part where the entire house loses power and you have to switch a breaker, which makes navigating the mansion feel even creepier and challenges your perception of it. An excellent move. Hell, even the items are a lot more cleverly designed. You can interact with the plate at the very beginning to pick up a shard that's used several times throughout the game. Items are found in much more reasonable places like cabinets. You can even get some light crafting mechanics by pressing everything in the item menu together. No Props even got rid of all the unused menu options in the last two games. It also has three endings, where you're offered a chance to escape, Hiroshi can actually ditch all his friends and escape alone, 
or you can travel throughout the entire mansion to put them into your party and evade the Oni to get the best ending that has actual character development. This all sounds tremendous, but like with every other version of Ao Oni, it's not without new flaws. The shortened mansion is fine to traverse, except when you're being chased by the Oni, because you basically have no room to try and avoid him. The only method I found that properly works is always running the library again, because it's the only room big enough to not instantly die in. So just weave around the shelves for like 20 seconds and then leave. Then you'll be good. I don't think the Oni is nearly as painful to work around as 3.0, but the random encounters can definitely suck ass. I, I appreciate that man, I've been broken and grown as a person, an Oni I guess. The biggest, most glaring problem with the game is its puzzles. They're more in-depth, more complicated, and take some brain power to figure out. The issue arises when all of them either make no sense or rely on literal random number generation to work. The most infamous example is the piano puzzle, that gives you numbers you need to enter into a door in the attic, but those aren't in the proper order. I don't even fully understand what's going on, so I'll just let the wiki explain for me. Just look at this. Just reading all this makes my head spin. You have a possible combination of 10 numbers to put into the code, but you only get around two chances to put it in, because the Oni immediately spawns behind you and will kill you if you don't get it right. And when you do, you still have to evade the Oni right away. I will be totally truthful, I stopped playing at this segment. The process to get the potential numbers completely crushed my desire to continue with 5.2. These numbers were consistent in 3.0. Why did no props decide to make them random? It's such a painful adjustment for no reason. This is why I credited Red Pikmin, because at this point I just watched him play the game after I stopped here. There's something I need to get my chest off about this game. No this series. Every time there's an improvement in a different version, something else goes wrong and is much worse than last time. And as of 2009, there wasn't really a definitive version of Aoni. Not one version has the charm of 1.1, the map of 5.2, and the nothing of 3.0. The Oni room isn't even in 5.2, it got removed, what gives? That was like the only good thing in the last game. I also find it weird that no props sticks to exact same elements, like uh, Takeshi hiding in the closet in every single game. It's not really a complaint, mind you, it's more of just an observation. He's really into the idea of a plate breaking being the reason why the group splits up. It's hard to tell how large Aoni had become in 2009, but I can confidently say it picked up a fairly sizable audience for a game of its type because fan games were beginning to prop up around this time. There's a particularly interesting fan game series called Kagame Oni, which acts as fan sequels to 5.2, following the same characters. You might have heard the name from the infamous Worst Chase Music Ever video. Kagame Oni is kind of a rabbit hole that could be its own video entirely, so I'll leave it alone for now. Go check out Stry Hiryu on YouTube if you want to know more about this game, as well as a ton of other Aoni and RPG Maker game content. This is it. What you've all been waiting for. Version 6.23 is far and above the most famous and influential Aoni game, as well as being the final version. It came out in 2011, two years after 5.2, and sports about triple the file size of its older sister game. The game was actually fully released and translated in English as well as Italian, hosted by No Props himself, while the English translation work was done by someone named JMU. I'll cut to the chase and say it. Version 6.23 is not only the best way to play Aoni, but a genuinely fun and pulse-pounding game in its own right. Just about every criticism I had with the previous versions have been addressed, and the game has flourished into something wonderful. Right as you start, you get to name Hiroshi, which has a lot of implications that don't come up until later, literally at the end of the game. All of the characters are acting as suspected, but take a look at the new portraits. 
they're all drawn in the same art style for once, still don't look even remotely like middle schoolers, I'm not sure if I'm a fan of these portraits. They stand out a whole lot less than whatever was going on with previous versions, and they just kind of look bland rather than charmingly mishmashed. Also, whoa, that translation is pretty, uh, interesting. It's entirely serviceable, and at no point can you not tell what's going on, but I don't know if it's just me, but the punctuation seems to have taken a big hit. Everyone speaks so awkwardly to each other, but I find it kind of charming, and I think a lot of other people do. I think part of the appeal of this franchise in the West is funny, spooky Japanese game, so the weird formatting of the text is hardly an issue. Not like the dialogue is critical to the story or gameplay anyways. Somehow, the mansion has been even more condensed, and another layout change happened. This carries all the positives that 5.2 had, but with one key difference. The Oni is actually fair this time around. No props must have altered the AI again or made his area of effect for getting a game over way less strict, because he is much less horrible to work with. Gone are the days of running to the library or hiding in closets, because the mansion is laid out in such a way that a quickly running through doors in separate buildings works much better with getting the Oni off your trail. Yes, I said separate buildings. Building off of what 5.2 did, 6.23 has several different varied locations that all look different from one another, that have their own separate puzzles and aesthetics, for the most part. This does wonders, not just for evading the Oni, but for helping you feel like you're progressing more than just entering the basement to climb out of the same tunnel again and again. The puzzles of 5.2 were some of the most frustrating, tedious, and nonsensical things I'd ever seen, but 6.23 does away with most of them. Literally, most of the annoying puzzles are flat out removed in place of much better puzzles. Look at the piano puzzle. They cut down the amount of answers in half, making brute forcing it so much easier. A prime example for a puzzle is this room right here. You're given a disc that has a bunch of colors, and this room has several buttons of the same colors. You aren't told, but when you see the segmentation of each colored part, the gears in your head are starting to turn. Press each button by color coordination, and then you get in. This is a pretty easy puzzle, so I don't mean to go all Bioshock Infinite on you and claim this game's puzzles are for 400 IQ gamers. But I feel I should at least showcase the huge leap forward No Props has made with his puzzle design. Something that has also been a huge glow up is the Oni himself. He doesn't just pop out of doors now, he bursts through the floors and out of much more unexpected locations, which makes the scares a lot more effective and unpredictable, combined with a much better balance of exploration, puzzle solving, and Oni chases, which makes for a very satisfying package. Curiously, you aren't given the option to save all of your friends or escape selfishly, which I feel is hugely disappointing, but this isn't without an upside. When Mika dies first, you can see her do something incredible. Her limp body transforms into another Oni, and is added as a second chaser you need to avoid. From that point on, the original bald Oni or the Mika Oni can chase you, and this is a marvelous change. The added difficulty is well balanced and feels earned, makes you feel even more desperate to escape, knowing that if you die, you become an Oni somehow. Takeshi is even driven to Crooked Man himself because of the stress of being inside the mansion. He's like 11 or 12 years old, which just makes the whole scenario super dark. And he becomes an Oni as soon as you leave the room and chases you. The most wild scenario is Takuro's, because you find him in a closet in the lower levels, hiding because he's hurt his ankle. You collect him to escape together, but the Oni ate the rope, and Takuro tripped and fell like Takeshi did in 3.0 because of his bum ankle, but we don't see what happens. Takuro shows up later on and forcefully joins your party, and near the very end of the game, during the last puzzle I think, which sucks, I hate the blue pieces puzzle. He literally turns into an Oni inside your character menu when you go to retrieve your item and begins to chase you. The last five minutes of the game proves no props as holding nothing back from scaring you. And I love it. 
Aoni takes advantage of the fact it's a video game to deliver a lot of unique scares that other mediums simply cannot do. Every so often we get a really out there jump scare that a lot of games just don't do. I think Aoni is impressive for having very effective jump scares, something that is so often lambasted for being cheap and lazy. The Onis, all of them, can appear through any door, or lord knows where else. Which makes you feel tense the entire time you play the game, not knowing when any of them come out and start chasing you. 6.23 can easily last over an hour, making it feel so much more satisfying to beat all of the puzzles, outrun all of the Onis, and escape with your life. They even added back the Oni room, which is actually very creepy, because some of the Onis break out of the cage, and when you leave and come back, all of them are completely gone in seconds, and you have to get back in the cage to retrieve a required item. Dead people turning into Onis is pretty interesting, and sets up some implications. Implications that will not be used, which stinks because this little man here should be included in more things. This is Blockman, and he's the hardest Oni creature in the franchise because he bum rushes you so fast. Once you beat the game, we're given... Wait, is that a password? Do you remember that you can name Hiroshi? Well, that's actually a password screen, where you can enter a variety of passwords given upon completing the game that changes various events or adds new features. This is an amazing system, it rewards you for completing the game by changing something ever so slightly to encourage replaying it. The more you play, the game becomes quicker because you will memorize the layout even further, memorize the puzzles even more, and amass a notepad document full of secret codes. The one I got first was Blockman, which changes the regular Oni's encounters to be Blockman encounters, which acts as a difficulty adjustment. There are a couple different codes, like God Mode, that makes you immune to game overs, with the exception of one or two scripted scenarios. My favorites are the JMU code, which add the English translator as an NPC to the game. I think you can even turn him into an Oni. And this specific code is absurd. Type South Park, and there's an entirely different game hidden inside where everyone is depicted as South Park characters. Even the Oni. It's more of an in-depth joke and is like, maybe 10 minutes long. But how could you not love this? Imagine thinking, what does my horror game not have? Oh yeah, a South Park version. I think more games should have South Park versions. Imagine Euphoria having a South Park mode. Actually, don't imagine that. With all this being said and done, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that the 2010s experienced an explosion of popularity for Aoni, far beyond what anyone, even no props, could have anticipated. It positively blew up in Japan, becoming a gaming phenomenon that people would force their friends to play on websites like Nico Nico. Its background music quickly got spread everywhere, and the iconic visage of the Oni himself became a mainstay representative of RPG maker horror games like a pseudo-mascot. There are so many Aoni fan games floating around that it simply isn't feasible to try and list a few without neglecting others. There are entire wikis entirely dedicated to categorizing Aoni fan games. I used to watch so many fan game playthroughs by some ordinary gamers back in the day that it isn't even funny. People from around the world, but especially Koreans for some reason, showed their love for the game by making their own either by creating a fan sequel or a whole new scenario and location with an original Oni design once they bought RPG Maker XP. In the West, it similarly blew up primarily because it was during the age where YouTube and other hosting sites began to experience their heyday, and people who were getting their foot in the door became colossal internet personalities. Like PewDiePie, Markiplier, Cory Kenshin helped spread the game even further. It's a bit difficult for me to give you a 100% definitive answer for the rise of the series because all the details are either over a decade old or aren't properly documented in English. But I can safely say, if something is popular in America and Japan at the same time, chances are it's going to become a worldwide thing. And Aoni had a lot going for it. 
It was completely free, could run on just about any computer, and was simply a fun horror game that didn't require an iron stomach or 400 IQ to play. I really think this is the reason why Aoni blew up. It's just a simple horror game that's fun to play or watch someone else play. It caught on with young people because of the influences and being free, especially in the West when RPG Maker games weren't super commonplace. It had weird monster designs, it was kind of scary, all the things were there for this to blow up. Yeah, that's right, white boy. Don't you ever insult me in my games ever again, punk. Uh, okay, okay, let's not make strange gaming racially charged, please. Maybe I alone feel this way, but it sits in a very different place compared to the other RPG Maker games, even ones that came out around the same time as 6.23. Something like Mad Father or Eeb has a totally different following. I would argue Aoni is closer to games like Slender than other RPG Maker games. It was something that could easily be shared around and earned a lot of bombastic reactions, which were all the rage in early 2010's internet. I've seen a lot of comments about people wishing for the good old days back, and I expect to get more of those comments echoing the same sentiment on that video. Aoni was simply just a fixture of early YouTube horror. By the way, if you're looking for more of those vibes for games like these, my channel is basically all about that, so stick around. I think it's incredibly interesting that all of its previous versions are so heavily documented and distributed. You don't see that a lot with other games of similar builds. Something like Yue Nikki has previous versions with new stuff added in each one, but the minor differences in details of each version of Al Oni is unique, let you chart out new props history as a game developer. Having played all the versions of the first game, I don't know if I'd recommend all of them. I already skipped over the demo versions, which are by definition unfinished, but I wouldn't recommend playing 3.0 or 5.2 because they just don't measure up to 1.1 and 6.23 in both small and large ways. 5.2 is just an inferior version of 6.23, and 3.0 sucks in general. At least with 1.1, you get the unmatched charm of seeing something made and released in 2000s compared to a couple years later in 2011. People began to take notice of how much the internet spread around Aoni, and within a few years, we were getting adaptations. A light novel series was penned as early as 2013. 2014 is when we started to get films, and past that is when games began to be developed and released for Aoni, all of which weren't developed by no props, but rather officially licensed, meaning other people had to pay him to use Aoni as a brand. Right now, there is currently a running MMO based off of Aoni that has crossovers with The Ring and various other anime. I'm not joking, look this up. The most recent game to my knowledge is Aoni X that came out in 2020. This all seems amazing that such a small free game with basically no story could reach such a point, where companies are begging you to license it, getting movies made about it, having this funny little California grapefruit become a popular character recognized by people around the world. But what if I told you, this is where a problem began to prompt up. But before that, let's decompress a bit. We've been here for a while and you're going to want to take a breather. So sit back and relax, and we'll be all right. We'll be right back. There's one massive, damning catch to this franchise past this point. The vast majority of it is only in Japanese. Now, this doesn't seem like much of a problem. The game has always been in Japanese, so how is that an issue? Obviously, it's immensely popular in Japan, but if you only focus on that one country, you neglect a huge swath of the fanbase that exists not only in America, 
but the greater world. It is inarguable that America was at least partly responsible for the huge boom of the series, but a huge majority of the content available for the franchise simply isn't translated, leaving English speakers largely in the dust. But what are we missing out? A prime example, and perhaps the only really applicable example, is Aoni 2, which came out in 2016. A lot of people might not have even known that there is literally a game just called Aoni 2. There's hardly any coverage of it on English YouTube, so I'll introduce everyone to this one slowly. Take my hand and I'll guide you through it. This is an officially developed sequel made by uh, a company called Litmus? that I've never heard of before. Not entirely sure if No Props was co-developing, or if he just advertised it, or if he was involved at all past his name, because all of those details are exclusively in Japanese. Here's the catch. This game wasn't made in RPG Maker, and it's only on mobile devices. I hope some people at home are starting to understand why I felt comparing to Aoni to Slender was more just than RPG Maker because 6.23, to my knowledge, is the last time Aoni was ever made with RPG Maker. Don't interpret that as me saying Aoni sold out or anything like that, but I do feel that a piece of itself was a little fragmented with the change. What is it made on now? Uh, who cares? Something you'll notice right away is that you are flooded, absolutely swamped with the most aggressive and in-your-face ads I've ever seen. There's always ads at the bottom of the screen. There's ads in the menu while you're trying to solve puzzles. I would hope being interrupted by advertisements would insist upon itself, but I will still explain why I think this sucks. I'm very much out of the loop with mobile games, but as far as I understand, this is par for the course. I, I don't care, this is obnoxious and it breaks the pacing of a horror game completely in two. I don't care if other games do it, being free to play really isn't all that great in the scheme of not being able to play the game for two minutes straight without being reminded of Uber Eats and BLM. Come on man, that's not how Mafia works. Don't you want to play that fake Pokemon Amori game? <sighs> I really wish that game was real. When did we get so comfortable with letting ads take over games like this? Is it because the game is free? Does it just happen so often that people wave their hands because it's a free mobile game? Exempting any possibility of a mobile game being considered a real video game? That's not the end of my issues with Aoni 2. Secondly, being a mobile game, it relies solely on touchscreen controls, which works fine for interacting with menus, but trying to control Hiroshi is horrible because your fingers are going to slide all over the screen, which makes precise inputs something critical to playing the game and especially running and hiding from the Oni, which is made about as much fun as an at-home vasectomy. The cursor can outright cover the gameplay, which can really screw you over during a tense moment, but if you turn the cursor off, have fun trying to make Hiroshi move in a predictable direction, much less avoid instant death. So the movement of the game is doomed by default, and you're constantly pestered with awful advertisements. Is there any positives this game has? Well, for starters, we're in a new location. Hiroshi and the gang go inside of an abandoned school to investigate rumors of a blue monster inside, which offers us a new location. If you're wondering why Hiroshi's friends are suddenly alive, I can't tell you that. I don't think Aoni 2 is officially a narrative sequel, but I can't really tell you if it's a reimagining or anything of the sort. The school does look pretty good and stands out from the mansion we're used to, which I had gotten fairly tired of after binging the series so much. Gives me real, uh, no, I can't say Corpse Party via this way too basic of a reference. Gives me the coma vibes for how popular the series is. There isn't a consistent story in like any of the games. It always picks up with a group of middle schoolers investigating an abandoned building and then nothing happens with any of the epilogues. You know what the craziest thing about this game is? It has gacha mechanics. I know how that sounds, but it's honestly not that bad. You can find collections of coin items throughout the story that you can only obtain after being forced to watch an ad, 
mind you, that let you roll for masks, which act as cosmetics for the Oni. They don't seem to change gameplay in any way, and I don't think there's an option to use real currency, so I'm honestly okay with it being in the game. I think the only thing you can pay for are the 3 times and 5 times speed modes, which act as turbo modes for the game. Why would you want that on mobile controls? Every time you beat the game, or die, you get an option to share your score, because the game acts kind of like an arcade, where you compare final scores with other players to see who was able to beat the game fastest and with the fewest saves. I think our only two clocks in at around an hour, maybe an hour and a half if you take your time. I say I think because, honestly, I didn't get very far in the game. I kind of glossed over it, but the two biggest problems I had with this game, the movement and the advertisements, completely destroyed any interest I had in solving the puzzles, which is a huge shame because there's a fair few things I like about this release. I love how the menus imitate how the original menus look despite not being made an RPG maker. I love the sound design, the classic Oni chase theme has been given excellent recomposition and sounds perfectly dramatic and fresh while keeping true to its simple roots. You can outright ask for hints at any point in the game for exploration and puzzles, which I didn't think was entirely warranted, but if you want to stomach more ads, you can get your tips in if you can't figure out how the puzzles work. It even links a walkthrough site, which I think is pretty funny. Did I even mention the multiple playable characters? I think by completing the game a couple times, you get to unlock multiple characters. They have shorter routes, but I think that's a really great idea that allows the characters to be fleshed out more, something that Kazd has desperately needed ever since the game came out. That's all fine and good, but when the game requires you to give yourself Carpal Tunnel to play, I don't really know if I want to play the game six times to see everything, and for another reason I'll elaborate on later, whatever the story leads to doesn't really matter for an English speaking audience. I know I can always get a proper game controller and one of those ugly clip-on devices to play without wanting to die, but do I really need to get so many peripherals just to play this game competently? Is it really worth looking like a tool to do so? You know what the Ao Oni mobile games remind me of? The original HD ports for Final Fantasy V and VI. For years, those were the most supported versions of V and VI, so people just had to tolerate that they looked ugly because it was all we had besides the Game Boy Advance versions or the Super Nintendo originals. Unlike V and VI, there was no pixel remaster, because Aoni 2 is stuck on mobile devices. And you know what the craziest thing is? This isn't the only game like that. Currently, there is Aoni 3, Aoni X, a full remake of the original Aoni, and an MMO game, all locked to mobile devices. And to twist the knife further, every one of those are in Japanese, untranslated. Do you know why people who are big into horror game scene the 2000s and 2010s always refer to Aoni in the past tense? Because they probably have no idea that it's a whole franchise that is still being updated to this day, but simply not translated for them, or playable in a comfortable fashion. That begs the question, why? Why did they stop at Aoni 2? Perhaps they felt that Western fans didn't contribute enough to the series at that point? I can understand that, because as it stands, Japan and perhaps Korea are probably like 80% of its current fan base who pays, but it all seems kind of inconsistent. The latest translated thing for Ao Oni has been the light novels, which completed sometime around 2019. So it's not like the brand as a whole has been abandoned for the West, but perhaps delayed or just not as big as a priority. This is only half of my case as to why Ao Oni simply isn't as popular as it could have been in the West. The second reason being it simply isn't keeping up with the times. The first game is unique in that it still has a bit of decent staying power in the minds of people around today as an old school RPG maker horror game that influenced so many after it. But think about all the other games that came out around its time. Most of those got ported to Steam in the early 2010s, if not fully remade at some point and sold on modern consoles. Ao Oni as a franchise has never touched Steam, which is a bigger problem than you'd think. Outside of a very specific user base of Japanese phone users, which is pretty substantial mind you, 
there's more barriers for people to play and share the game. How Oni first blew up because it was freely available on NoProp's website and was in English. Now, if you want to play the series past the second game, you either have to know Japanese or rig together some kind of overlay or just take someone's word for what happens later on. It's for this reason that I didn't really want to play Aoni 3, X, or the remake, which is a crying shame. Because I would have loved to see the original game getting a huge facelift, even in the compromised, ad-bloated depiction that is a mobile-only remake. I hate to harp on how much I dislike a lot of the features of mobile games, but I'm sure someone out there likes them, despite the fact this may be the first time people are even finding out they exist. I just can't help but feel a lot of the soul of the series is gone. What was once charming has become kind of sterile and not engaging. I'm still down to play the latter games, but until they come out in English, I'll just stay put. Maybe I'll make learning Japanese like a Patreon goal, like if I hit a thousand dollars a month I'll teach myself Japanese or something. Even now, 20 years later, we have another RPG Maker series that is matching Aoni's popularity if not surpassing it. Fear and Hunger, while it plays basically nothing like Aoni, is the latest RPG maker horror darling that has been taking the internet by storm the last 2-3 years. And while I don't personally enjoy the game all that much, it's something I respect tremendously for being a huge piece in a genre I've come to cherish so intently. It might seem a little too big picture to say something like, without Ao Oni, Fear and Hunger simply wouldn't exist, but I really don't think it's far off from the truth. Ao Oni set a standard at the time, and it was undeniably a trailblazer. People wanted to make games that looked like Ao Oni, that had simple controls of characters walking around a mansion and avoiding monsters. However, that trail is becoming thinner and harder to navigate because it's largely fallen out of favor because it's becoming harder and harder to be a fan of the series. I wouldn't be able to predict a huge resurgence if all the games were magically translated and put onto Steam, that there would be a huge revitalization of the series right away. But regardless of what happened this next, Aoni deserves its flowers. Its purple colored, big, bulky flowers. Pat yourself on the back, no props. You should be proud of your work and enjoy whatever comes next for you. Damn right I deserve my flowers. And you know what? I actually agree with everything you just said. Go off, King. My games may be simple, they may even be outdated by today's standards, but I set today's standards. I'm living proof you don't need to be the best in your field, but just being the best version of yourself can achieve just as much, if not more. Don't be afraid to make your own silly little RPG maker projects. You never know what might happen next. I appreciate that, Oni. Very well said. Today will not be the last day we meet, because at some point in the future, I plan to cover the various depictions and adaptations of how Oni has had throughout the years, mainly the light novels and films. But that is for another time. But what time is that? Well, you'll have to subscribe and stay tuned to find out. And until then, have a lovely rest of your day.